Well, it, it sounds also more democratic than what we have in Hong Kong, where we basically oh, yeah. have no more opposition legislators anymore. So. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Well, some people say it's not, but it is more democratic. Yeah. Good morning, Ed. I see you there, too. Good morning. Uh, Good day to everybody. The, nice to see you. Hello. The election for the parliament, Senator House. Yes. Um, it, it is a low probability that uh, both of the seats that are up for election in early January uh, will go to the Democratic side. Um, so uh, it is likely that the upper house of the U.S. the Senate will will likely stay under the opposition control. Yes. Morning, Subhadra. Uh, hi, Carmen. <clears throat> I can hear your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll put it on mute. <laughs> no. That's nice. And who else is here? Muggsy is here. Good morning, Muggsy. Hi, Carmen. How are you? No, no, it's not good morning. It's good afternoon for you. Good afternoon, yeah. yes. You're just Waiting for Clara. I'm good. You all fine? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, I guess it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to send a, a WhatsApp to Clara. Please keep talking so the people see that something is going on here. Right. <laughs> um, hello, Maxi. <laughs> Hi, Subhadra. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Edge. How are you? I haven't I'm seen well, you for a I'm, long time. Well, I'll show you me. Show me um, your face. Yeah, Maxi. Yeah, yeah. You're it's looking my, fine. Good. Thank you, my. But my system is not great, so I'll leave the video off most of the time. Okay. So how's it? Uh, doing well? Sorry, oh, we lost you. Yeah. You Your internet connection is not very good, Subhadra. And people who are watching, please, uh, Tell, tell us your name and where are you from in the chat. That would be good. We, we published the, the chat in the website of WCAA along with the video. Well, it's not coming. So it's streaming on Facebook, Carmen? Carm yes, oh, I'll clarify. Facebook, it. right? I'm here. I mean, in right. Facebook uh, and YouTube, and afterwards we are going to edit the, the video and put it on our website. Clara? Yeah. You are Hello. now the leader right. of our conversation. Yeah. Uh, I think we still have one minute to wait. No. No, it's already on the, on the hour. On the hour? Okay. All right. So let's start. So let me see how we have 44 people. Okay. So, so should we start? Yes, just say hi to Virginia, who is up here too, and you can start. Okay. So, okay, let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Clara Saraiva. I'm part of the WCA organizing committee and also the president of the Portuguese Anthropological Society. And we are here again today for another WCA webinar. Uh, as you might know, if you've been an assiduous uh, participant or uh, viewer, uh, the WCA webinars uh, have been taking place once a month since April uh, with various themes. They are all in our website. And WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, 
that organizes these webinars is part of WAL, the World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. And it's in the website of WAL, which has both parts, WCA and IUAES, that you will be able to watch all the previous webinars. So first of all, I want to thank everyone all the participants and all the colleagues from the organizing committee who always helped me put this together. Uh, Michelle Bouchard, Carmen Rial, um, also Virginia Domingue. I also want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded. And um, as I said, it will be then online. I ask you everyone to please turn off your mic mics and if you are not one of the speakers, one of the participants, it is advisable that you also uh, keep your video off because otherwise it kind of buffs up the, the, the connection. Um, and also like Carmen said before, when you enter the chat where you can, you know, write your comments or ask your questions, please do identify yourself because we do keep the we do records, um, the, the chat as well. So it's interesting for WCA and for a while to know where you come from, which country, which association, etc. And uh, besides the special thanks to the colleagues in the WCA organizing committee, I want to give a very special thanks to Michelle Bouchard from the University of Northern British Columbia, who is the host, the technical host of the webinar. Uh, Ricardo Faguago from Mexico, who is in charge of the communications task force and uh, always does the spreading of the news through the social media. And last but not least, Silmara Takazaki from Brazil, who always does such a nice poster um, that is sort of the ad for this webinars. So today we will have several colleagues from five, from six different countries actually, I was going to say five. And um, so we will have from Hong Kong, Gordon Matthews, from India, Subatra Shana, from Poland, Lucas Kazmarek, I hope I'm saying it right, from Spain, Catalunya, uh, Begonia Engix, from Brazil, Leticia Cesarino, and from the USA, Ed Libo. And uh, before passing the word to each one of them, I will briefly, very briefly present each one of the speakers. Um, well, we always start on, uh, we always use a logic that comes, goes from east to west. So we'll start with the countries in the easternmost time zone and then moving towards the west. So from Hong Kong, we have our colleague from the WCA organizing committee, Gordon Matthews. Gordon Matthews is a professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong um, in the Department of Anthropology. And he has written among many others, a ghetto at the center of the world, Chungking Mansions um, in Hong Kong. And then another famous book called The World in Guangzhou, Africans and Other Foreigners in South China's global marketplace. Gordon is well known for his fight for civil rights in, in Hong Kong, and it's a pleasure to have him here with us today. From India, we have Subhadra Chana, who is an emeritus professor uh, at the Delhi University and, vi and senior vice president of the IUAES. She's also chair of the Commission on Marginalization and Global Apartheid of IUAES. She works on marginalization and identity, gender, religion, and cosmology, ecology, and landscapes. She has received several prestigious international awards and fellowships, and is, of course, the author of many books and papers. From Poland, we have Lukas Kazmarak from the Institute of Anthropology and Ethnology, Adam Mikwitz University in Potsdam, and also a member of the Polish Ethnological Society. He researches on post-colonialism, social mobility, identity, and power in several locations, following closely the development of social political situations and reflecting uh, on resistation, re uh, protest in the streets, conferences, venues, and classrooms. From Spain, we have Begonia Engix, um, and a professor in the Arts and Humanities Department of the Universidad Alberta de Catalunya and also a member of the Catalan Institute of Anthropology. She, she is also the principal researcher of the project Genders and Postgender, and also of the project Knitting, Secession and Sovereignty, Politics, Emotion and Affect. 
and she is also the PI of the research group Medusa, Genders in Transition, Masculinities, Bodies, Affects, and Technoscience. From Brazil, we have our colleague Leticia Cesarino, who is a professor uh, at, of anthropology at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianópolis, Brazil. She um, draws on interdisciplinary work in the fields of anthropology, science and technology studies and cybernetics. And her current research explores how illiberal politics, disinformation and neoliberalism are being co-produced through contemporary digital media, media infrastructures. Last but not least, Ed Libo, who is also known to many of us. Uh, he is the, ex for the past eight years, has been the executive director of the American Anthropological Association. Before, he was a research scientist and a program director for the Battelle Memorial Institute, a nonprofit research organization focused on social health health and environmental policy in the US and the world. He's also affiliated with the University of Washington's anthropology department since 1986. So this is the presentation of our participants today, whom I want to thank very, very much for being here with us today. We have a sort of a controversial topic, contemporary politics and anthropology. And we have sent to the participants some suggestions, some sort of sub themes that they can pick on to to do their, you know, their, to talk, or of course, you, they are more than welcome also to pick their own topics. The two questions we addressed um, were basically, first of all, should anthropologists directly engage in contemporary politics? And does anthropology relate directly to politics in your country? And if yes, how, the, how does this take place? So um, of course, these are just, as I said, very general uh, sub themes. And now we will move to start the discussion. I will ask all the participants to please keep their interventions short. So as I told you in the several emails I sent you, please do not speak more than you know four or five minutes tops. So we can go around all the group for the first time, then come back a second time and then allow uh, the participants to answer questions and comments that will surely come up in the chat room, in the chat list, okay? So thank you very much. So following the East to West, we will start with Hong Kong. So Gordon, okay. I give you the word. Sure. And I'm Gordon Matthews and uh, I am an American citizen. I have an American passport, but I've been living in Hong Kong for the past 25 years. Hong Kong is based not on passport, but on residency. And I'm a permanent resident of Hong Kong. I uh, hope to be able to die in Hong Kong uh, decades hence. Now, the question of contemporary politics and anthropology, anthropologists in Hong Kong are directly involved in politics, whether they like it or not. Last year, when all the protests were taking place, there was a personal choice anthropologists got to make as to whether or not to participate. Today, though, we might wind up in jail for our teaching. And for that reason, we cannot avoid politics. Beijing imposed the national security law on Hong Kong uh, on July 1st of this past year. And the national security law prohibits succession, subversion, terrorism, or collusion with foreign forces, but in remarkably vague ways. Hong Kong itself has a British Commonwealth law that is written in rather narrow specific ways. Laws on the mainland are rather written in a vaguer way, enabling the Communist Party to jail those who violated it, mean, including you know, being a public nuisance or uh, dis you know, disturbing public order for a number of different charges. Now, the national security law, nobody knows what it may mean, but the worry is that the very act of teaching may be enough to get one thrown in jail if one teaches in certain ways. Several secondary school teachers in the last uh, couple of months have lost their jobs and are threatening jail sentences for teaching about things like Hong Kong independence, discussing it in class. Uh, several teachers in my own department in Hong Kong have decided not to teach classes like the anthropology of China for fear that it could offend Hong Kong's big neighbor to the north and cause them to get in severe trouble. I myself am teaching a class called the culture of Hong Kong that must go into the recent culture of protest in Hong Kong because how can you talk about what Hong Kong is without talking about that? 
Now, I've investigated this with the provost and the dean and various other people, my whole department has, and we are told that we can teach in line with critical thinking. In other words, present all different points of view and let students make up their minds on their own. Fine. The problem with this, however, remains that it wouldn't be the university that would decide we'd get in trouble, it would be police. And there's always the worry in the back of my mind and the back of many other people writing for media in Hong Kong or taking a somewhat outspoken position that you could get a knock on the door at 6 a.m. and the police will come and take you away. Now, the backdrop of all this is that anthropology in Hong Kong up until this past year has been fundamentally different from that in mainland China. In mainland China, anthropology does primarily involve the study of minority nationalities, and much of it means affirming what the Communist Party has been doing for these minority nationalities, these ethnic groups in China. Uh, some of my former students, one has lost his job in China for teaching about, in mainland China, for teaching about civil society. Another has been under house arrest for several months for uh, writing about Muslims in China. In Hong Kong, it's been fundamentally different. Hong Kong's anthropology has much more resembled the anthropology in the United States, in most Western European societies, in Japan, in Korea, than it has been like anthropology in mainland China. And our concern is that Hong Kong will become just like mainland China. Now, let's not exaggerate here. Hong Kong is not like Nazi Germany, for example, or North Korea. Some of my students are talking that way, but no, it's not. Uh, in the protests of last year, in fact, no one was proven to have been killed by police. Police did many brutal things. Uh, that's clear and documented, but nobody was killed. If these protests had taken place in the U.S., you might have had 300 people killed. So that has to be remembered. What we do see in Hong Kong, though, is the increasing loss of freedom of expression and freedom in the classroom. It appears that we are under a shadow if we teach as we have. I myself am doing this because I'm old. I don't feel like I'm in much danger. Some of my younger colleagues are engaged in a considerable degree of self-censorship because they see their careers on the line. Now, let me make one final brief note before I run out of time here concerning democracy. Protesters overwhelmingly have supported a democratic Hong Kong, but they also have supported in America, Donald Trump, under the principle that any enemy of China is a friend of mine. That's been their principle. Western media portrays Hong Kong protesters as valiant heroes for democracy. Indeed they are, and yet the fact is that many of them, like Jimmy Lai, the publisher of Apple Daily, had been supporters of the Western leader who has done most to try and derail democracy. And I argue with him quite a bit about this. However, at the end of the day, for me, freedom of expression and freedom of choice of one's leaders still are the absolute values I will live by, even if citizens in so many countries today don't necessarily vote for the leader who will help preserve democracy. Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong is an indication of an idealism towards democracy that we are losing in much of the rest of the world. And I enormously appreciate these Hong Kong protesters, but I have great worry and fear over what will happen in the future of Hong Kong. Can Hong Kong continue? Most of my students say no and are thinking of emigrating. I'm a little more optimistic, but we will see. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to activate my, <laughs> to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Gordon. So we will have our next presenter, Subhadra Shana. Thank you very much from India, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Clara. Although I am, of course, Indian, but at present I am in the US. Anyway, uh, very interesting because when Gordon was talking and he's talking about an extreme left regime, and the kind of, uh, you know, the oppressions and the kind of draconian rules and laws that can be put in place when you have an extreme left that is a communist regime. But very similar, when I come to India, we have an extreme, at present, an extreme right regime. And it is, the things are not any different. And that's something which uh, is something which makes each one of us think that what it is when we are talking about a political regime, I mean, when we talk of extreme right and extreme left and how similar ultimately they start to look. 
Uh, as for the first question, should anthropologists engage in politics? I think what is very important for us to understand and remember is the basic principles and ethics of the discipline. Uh, now, the basic principles and ethics of our discipline does encourage, and that is something which we imbibe and inculcate during our student days and as teachers, is the respect for human diversity and also to treat humans as humans, like not like economists, you know, not treat them like ciphers or statistics. So there we have a very great involvement because of our ethnographic uh, methods. We get to be very involved with human. We get to be very uh, involved with human daily lives and integrities of their existence. And the second aspect is the empirical methodology, which leads us into analyzing realities of situations as they are. So we are committed to this empirical reality. We are committed to the data as we find it. And obviously, it is not necessary that what we find as anthropologists, what we see on the field, is likely to tally with what needs to be projected from the you know, perspective of those who are in power. And there is a necessarily uh, a kind of, um, you know, uh, you can say a friction or a possibility of contestation and sometimes even violence in this regard. So as Gordon was saying that uh, there, is, uh, there is difficulty in uh, trying to tell the uh, students about exactly what is happening, but people do, and most of us do, and most of us have been doing. Um, uh, some, and some instances are coming in very recently, though this has not happened earlier, but in the very last uh, couple of years, some teachers are in jail for saying or teaching supposedly things that they should not have. So, I mean, so the situation, I mean, very ironically, I mean, you go from one uh, edge of the spectrum to the other and you come to the same situation, uh, irrespective of, uh, you know, whether you are talking of right or left. So that I find is something which one needs to investigate analytically as political anthropologists, we should be also concerned about that. Uh, the second aspect of um, uh, should uh, anthropologists engage in politics or what influence anthropology has that. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know which way I should put it. In the earlier phase of uh, Indian uh, politics, anthropologists did play critical roles. That is, they were uh, very much influential in uh, shaping politics and policies of the government and they held key positions. But slowly this is being eroded. Uh, in fact, there is, uh, as it is the case of most, uh, uh, now I have to say that it seems that any kind of extreme uh, political ideology tries to ease out humanities and social sciences or philosophies because that is the, those are the thinking disciplines and they cannot be encouraged if you want to have a totalitarian regime. So obviously, I mean, uh, these are not the subjects that are getting very much attention and they are the ones that are being pushed out from policies and all. But India happens to have a very large indigenous population, what are known as tribes. And there, of course, the expertise of the anthropologists have always been encouraged and welcomed. Uh, but there are lots of critical issues there because there is now a great uh, contestation between environmentalism, people who are the forest dwellers, and of course the development projects and the corporate interests. And of course this particular regime is very much in tune with the corporates and the mega, mega business projects. So that way there is a direct conflict now between uh, the indigenous people's interests. And, and one, uh, one 
point where I think anthropologists have been uh, coming in is uh, to convert or to present the tribes as Hindus, which the tribes are protesting, but you know, within the democratic framework, this is this has now become a point of contestation. So that is where a lot of people are engaged in thinkers and activists and uh, academic activists. So these are just a few points that I wanted to mention. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Subhadra, for your participation. So we will go to the next um, colleague, uh, Lukas from Poland. Uh, did I say it correctly? Kaz Kazmarek? Yes. Yeah? Uh, I know it's terrible. You can call me Lukas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Wukash, but you know. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. to communicate. Uh, okay. Um, just to um, briefly describe the situation in Poland, uh, it's uh, probably not possible, but uh, I will try not to miss uh, important points. Uh, our country uh, is uh, much more. Uh, Homogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous than uh, India <laughs> or uh, even Hong Kong. And uh, um, since the uh, struggle for independence in 19 and the beginning of 20th century, uh, it is uh, shaped in the nationalistic uh, discourse, which is cultivated uh, on the level of uh, education, especially, but it's also present or omnipresent in uh, politics. Uh, almost each uh, political party is uh, claiming uh, that uh, they are uh, party representing Polish people, Polish uh, traditional uh, values, and uh, they will defend it uh, from uh, the evil influences of uh, East or West, depends on the perspective. Uh, but what we can also... What we can also observe uh, is that uh, Poland is one of the many countries in the uh, world uh, uh, that are under the influence of a rising uh, new model of populism. Uh, the populism, uh, which is, uh, I would say, it doesn't matter if, it's, uh, if it is uh, far right or far uh, left, they are um, trying to position people um, to feel that uh, they are um, all the same and uh, the political leaders or some um, representative of some uh, economical uh, interest groups would um, <clears throat> uh, defend them from the treat, uh, from treat from the outside influences and uh, they will guarantee uh, that they probably won't be rich, but they will be safe. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, causing the rising um, number of uh, vulnerable groups um, because this kind of uh, discourse uh, tends to indicate the uh, new groups uh, of enemies. So uh, in Polish context, uh, it could be uh, some foreign uh, or so-called foreign uh, ethnic group like uh, Germans or Jewish people or Russians or uh, uh, I don't know, Roma and Sinti people. Uh, as well, it could be um, LGBT plus or like in present situation, it could be um, um, uh, uh, women as a vulnerable group uh, because uh, our uh, ruling uh, coalition um, corrupted um, activity of a constitutional court and uh, replaced the um, judges with um, people who act like party members. So uh, those people just uh, um, decided that uh, abortion in Poland is uh, uh, illegal, except a very, very, very uh, narrow group of the cases, and uh, that uh, women cannot uh, make any decision uh, if uh, they uh, 
want if they are ready to uh, have a baby. Uh, so uh, they are deprived all the field uh, to make any decision in this field. As well, this uh, government uh, for six years uh, now, they are making uh, also um, anti-conception uh, very hard. So uh, they are uh, forcing the pharmacy workers <laughs> to uh, make a decision, they can decide if uh, they would sell, uh, sell you uh, some uh, pills or not. So this is um, very complicated. So the anthropologists in this situation are uh, rising, um, are getting uh, less and less uh, neutral, meaning that uh, we used to be pretty distance from commenting uh, the ongoing politics. However, now uh, mm, we cannot uh, stay aside. So we are discussing with our students. Uh, we are present together with our students on the demonstrations and protests and manifestations. Uh, our uh, students, they make uh, their own actions in order to protest. So. Uh, now we are observing uh, uh, the shift in uh, um, character of anthropology as a community in Poland. So we are getting more and more involved. And uh, for a couple of years, uh, we've been organizing, uh, we call it anthropological interventions. Uh, so we uh, have been uh, organizing some manifestations in order to support the refugees because Polish government, of course, uh, rejected uh, all the um, European cooperation in order to, um, let's say, welcome the refugees from um, different uh, countries. And uh, we, uh, in Poznan, we organized a migrant info point in order to uh, make uh, the uh, migrants uh, everyday life uh, as uh, easy as uh, it's possible. Of course, we cannot do everything, but we can advise and we can l help them uh, filling some administrative papers. So we are trying uh, as a not really numerous uh, um, group of people are trying to be more and more active and uh, use our experience uh, and uh, expertise in order to uh, inform society uh, that uh, in Poland is rising number of uh, vulnerable groups and uh, the society is able to make their lives easier if uh, we will uh, communicate, if we will support and uh, cooperate just. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, Lucas, thank you very much. Uh, so the next participant is from Catalonia, Spain, uh, Begonia Engix. Am I saying it right? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Clara. I am Begonia Engix. I am a member of the Catalan Institute of Anthropology. And I am afraid I am not going to explain you about the situation in Catalonia because my interest or my main interest now is connected to a research project on Catalan secessionism and pro-independence organizations in relation to gender and affects. Uh, this project is formed by a team with three social anthropologists, a social psychologist and two research assistants. So my answer to the question Clara posed should anthropologists directly engage in contemporary politics is yes. We have now in Spain some anthropologists in office as deputies. However, my answer refers to us anthropologists being engaged as researchers on this field. And then my answer is a yes, because doing research on the world we inhabit includes contemporary politics. But I would like to share with you and open a debate on some of the challenges this poses from my experience, my particular experience with this project. 
The first challenge I want to open is what do we talk about when we talk about politics? Is it politics with a capital letter, parties, organizations, institutions, activism, or is it politics as embodied critical and transformative experience as for instance, feminist politics? How do we negotiate this field as anthropologists then? The second challenge is, uh, consists on the fact that being tied to the present is an ethnographic mandate. My research with pro-independence organizations has shown me how difficult ethnographic research can be in a sensitive and changing context. Let me give you an example. We plan to start our interviews in October 2019, but on the 14th of October 2019, the Spanish Supreme Court made public the sentence to prison of part of the Catalan government because of the previous organization of an illegal referendum on independence in 2017. Other leaders, as you probably may know, went to exile. Uh, you probably remember the images of the occupation of Barcelona airport and the battles in the center of Barcelona with burning rubbish bins everywhere. Of course, that was a good moment for observation, for content analysis and for digital ethnography but we had to wait a couple of months until everybody's mind and soul settled down and we could start with our interviews. Since then, some pro-independent organizations have appeared, others have changed, some have disappeared. Political contexts are so rapidly changing that they require a constant refinement and adaptation for research and that can be a problem for slow science, but also for funded projects with strict deadlines. This is the case of the project I'm talking to you about. The third challenge refers to vulnerability understood in terms of the vulnerable position of participants, but also of researchers in the field. In the context of state repression because of the illegim illegitimate or legitimate claim for independence, participants are difficult to contact. Of course, we meet all the ethical standards of fair research, but still they are afraid, afraid to talk, afraid to meet us, and afraid of what we can publish. Regarding to the vulnerability of researchers, what about our ideology and political stance? Should it be exposed or kept for us? How does it affect our position in the field and our research? Can a feminist anthropologist work with the far right, for instance? What kind of data are produced through that combination or confrontation. And the fourth and last challenge refers precisely to the publication of our results. When we are in a sensitive context, as is the case of Catalonia nowadays, what do we say, what do we silence? I have found myself revising my papers in order not to quote from fieldwork more than the strictly necessary. I have found myself not including sensitive information that could endanger participants. And that is in an occasion when I feel particular particularly lucky because my research is centered on emotions and gender, aspects that seem less problematic than other aspects. I insist to uh, the participants in the research that I am not interested in knowing about their next 
action, violent action for some. I just, it's another kind of uh, data I'm looking for, but still they are afraid. So the social political context affect the field and doing ethnography in these contexts has become a difficult endeavor. These are just some of the ideas I wanted to share with you in order to open a debate, so thank you. Thank you very much, Begonia. Uh, we will now move to our colleague from Brazil, Leticia, Leticia Cesarino. Are you there? Hello, yes. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Clara. Thank you for inviting me over. Thanks, Carmen, as well. Uh, I love to be in this kind of very diverse anthropological environments with colleagues from uh, especially other parts of the global south. Um, so about politics and anthropology in Brazil, um, you might have heard that um, historically anthropologists and social scientists um, at large have, have played um, significant roles as um, uh, not just in um, native nation building projects in an ideological sense, but also being part of actual governments, like as ministers and even uh, in the 90s there was um, Brazilian president who was a sociologist and his wife was an anthropologist, Fernando Henrique and Ruth Cardoso. Uh, Darcy Ribeiro was very important in the 60s as minister of education, right? So, but the thing is that these, um, this more direct um, kind of influence happened, of course, during progressive um, governments, both before and after the military period that lasted for around um, 30 years in Brazil. And in, in those periods, Periods anthropologists have had um, important uh, roles to play in policy design, for instance, uh, indigenous rights and education and traditional community rights, especially during the uh, drafting of the 1988 constitution after the, um, the military period. Now, right now, the thing is, um, for the past two years, we have a government that is basically undoing uh, the 1988 um, um, framework, and um, it's of course a far right government that does have popular support, although less than it did two years ago during the election. So uh, the role of anthropology and social, social sciences at large, I think it gets very tricky because Bolsonaro basically um, portrays anthropologists and and scholars from the human sciences at large based very openly as enemies, as enemies of the nation and a good deal of the university, especially public universities um, as well. So we do have colleagues that have, for instance, self exilated um, in the US like Deborah Genis, who has worked with reproductive uh, rights and has received a lot of death threats. So she did choose to leave. And the government, every once in a while, um, uh, there is a leaking of these lists the government does, you know, and other uh, communicators that they just don't, um, uh, there's, um, you know, um, uh, uh, strange things are not openly uh, dictatorial or authoritarian. There's always in these gray zones, but um, the danger is that um, that will follow a path uh, if he continues in power right now and gets reelected in two years, that can become actually dangerous for, for scholars um, here in Brazil. Now, I think uh, anthropologists, of course, should be involved and should be um, continue to do um, uh, activism um, uh, along with the groups that um, they always did, right? Minorities and indigenous groups and then gender-based and others. But um, based on my own research in the past two years about this co-production between populist communication, digital media, uh, uh, post-truth, uh, I sense that anthropology could play a bigger role, very promising one, but very much untapped as, um, uh, in, as communicators in the broad cybernetic sense, because the way um, uh, politics has worked in Brazil, and I feel like in many countries where there is this rise of pop, the populist right, right? The thing that I've, I've been noticing in other um, anthropologists too, right? Is that the, the form of efficacy in policy has 
politics has has been changing a lot so uh it's not um it has become increasingly tied to um aspects of people's lives that are very elementary in a sense so i feel like uh, anthropology as a four field discipline right as a holistic discipline it it does it's very well positioned to uh, help make sense of uh, uh how the efficacy of this kind of far right and populist political discourse has worked because it does have a lot to do not just with culture in the cultural anthropology sense but with the uh, linguistic aspects with technical material aspects of media and even with biological aspects having to do with embodied cognition which is very much the cognitive layer where um uh the kind of political populist communication holds its efficacy and also where digital media usually um, also works. So I think uh, anthropology could, anthropologists could be helping um, make sense of uh, what works and what doesn't work in policy today and also help design better, um, better communication and better discourse for uh, progressive uh, uh, sectors. And I know it seems weird to say um, design discourse, but <laughs> From my point of view, that's exactly what um, Bolsonaro did in 2018, and the far right has been doing uh, uh, all along, and they know how to use this media, and we are lagging very much behind, and I do sense there is a huge potential for a new kind of communication, a new kind of discourse that um, uh, takes into account the really transitional moment that we're going through, right? I feel like, at least from the point of view of Brazil here, we're really living through a paradigm shift of sorts. You know, Bolsonaro, he's not um, destroying what existed. He's basically occupying what, whatever existed that was uh, these categories and institutions of the, the our progressive constitution, and he infects it from within. So we have a minister of the environment who basically favors um, the most extractive kind of industries there is, right? Mining and logging. We have um, a human rights um, evangelical minister who didn't close down her minister, but she's basically subverting what what the category of human right means. And the same thing for the guy who occupies the racial justice um, foundation is a guy who basically doesn't believe racism exists in Brazil. So they're really corroding what existed right before uh, uh, our democratic protects, uh, progressive framework from within. And it's all very discursive, although they're doing, of course, um, some concrete actions as, as well. I feel like, um, there is this um, layer, this political layer, that's very discursive communication, where I think anthropologists could be contributing more than we are right now. So, so far, that's my message. Thank you very much, Leticia. So now it's not, you know, we're just going from east to west. And in fact, we're going also from bad to worse, as normally we say, because now we leave Bolsonaro and we go to Trump. So we have Edward, or better known as Ed Lebo. And well, my congratulations, at least you were able to kick Trump out. So let's hear Ed and um, see what he has to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Clara. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be here. I'm actually not going to talk so much about um, the current national administration. Um, uh, the direct answer I would offer to the question about whether anthropologists should directly engage in contemporary politics is emphatically yes. Uh, uh, we, we subscribe to a view that's often attributed to the American anthropologist Ruth Benedict, who's said to have said that the main purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human difference. Uh, this is co quite consistent with what uh, Subhadra had said earlier uh, today, and it is inherently a political stance, uh, but I also think it's equally political to refrain from intervening, leaving it to others to interpret uh, and apply the anthropological research findings uh, to the resolution of policy problems. I've been thinking about our colleagues uh, ar around the world talking about teaching and research and communicating as political acts. And what that makes me uh, want to draw on is uh, experiences in, in your introduction to my own career. I have worked in the policy 
world for four decades. Um, and I think that something that's very important, once you've said, yes, we should be directly engaged, the question becomes one of how to do that effectively. Uh, and, I, and I would like to uh, suggest that uh, we can be most effective in influencing uh, policy and politics uh, by shifting away from a common form of argument that we offer, which I would call the exceptionalist critique. Um, we, we, and, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we, we often um, are motivated by social critique to try to uh, work with and amplify the voices of underserved and disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, communities. And the vast majority of the data that we uh, collect and interpret focuses on uh, the local. And we, and we do this for a variety of purposes, um, often to dispel this sort of blaming the victim logic by placing um, what we observe in a larger context and how that larger context restricts uh, the choices that are available locally um, or the balance between serving a national interest and the local burdens that are borne by, uh, by the communities with whom we work most closely. But the key thing here is that public policy addresses general cases not exceptional circumstances. Um, and our critique often takes the form of this policy is horrible because it um, uh, doesn't take into account the exceptional circumstances of the community with which I'm most familiar and most closely allied. Um, and, and our arguments are not terribly persuasive with policy reformers when they take this exceptional form, uh, because it appears that it's based on local self-interest. And while local self-interest may, um, may engage us and our collaborators, it meets with limited success in the policy reform arena, largely because uh, exceptionalism is often at odds with some uh, prevailing uh, principles of fairness. Uh, by singling out uh, this group um, that is considered somehow unfair. And so I think um, uh, trying to be very brief here, uh, I think that we can be very effective in uh, our work. It's important for us not to relinquish the conveying, as, as Leticia just said, of communicating um, the findings um, of our own research and that of our colleagues. Um, uh, to, uh, to engage publicly in policy reform, but in order to engage effectively, we have to speak the same language that they do. We need to um, be able to provide the more general context in which our local observations um, are found and attend uh, much more carefully to issues of multiple scales of impact simultaneously. Uh, trying to be respectful of the time. I know a lot of talk in the chat here. So, uh, uh, so, so thank you for that and uh, I'll be interested in comments and responses. Thank you very much, Ed. So we've finished the first, um, the first set of interventions. Uh, I have to say that uh, this was a complicated webinar to put up uh, to organize simply because we all thought at, in the organizing committee that there were some countries that should be there. Unfortunately, nowadays, as you know, the list of countries with complicated contemporary politics and where right-wing uh, governments are taking over is too big, unfortunately. It's, so we, I, in the beginning, I, I did plan to have uh, um, colleagues from, um, from Israel. Um, I wanted to have somebody from Venezuela. I wanted to have somebody from Hungary also. But then, well, we cannot have everyone at the same time. And also some colleagues just simply could not make it this time. So it's always, you know, it's always a bit of a, a roller coaster to decide who or who can take part uh, depending on people's availability. So once again, I really want to thank all the ones that are here today. 
that I think are very, very important for us to discuss this contemporary politics and anthropology issue, which is, of course, on top of everyone's uh, minds and worries. So um, now that we finished the first round, we'll go to the second round and we will have Gordon again. So starting again, east to west. Uh, Gordon, for you, it's fairly late. I'm having an international thing. We have some people, it's already midnight. For others, it's 5 a.m. So thanks again. Okay, you're not going to ask me a question. I just shoot. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. I'm, uh, yeah. Okay. Pardon, uh, you, you're the, the idea of having a second round is so that the participants can sort of uh, interact, you know, uh, react okay. to the other's interventions or the chat Perfect. or whatever you like. Um, the one thing I'd like to react to is one of the commentators in the chat room said explicitly that uh, one fear is of right-wing regimes. But I want to go back to what Subhadra was saying that, no, it can be right-wing or left-wing. It can be either one. There is certainly no privilege of left-wing regimes. Now, what left-wing and right-wing mean differ in different societies, uh, clearly. In, in a Hong Kong context, left-wing means Chinese communists. And that's certainly not what left-wing would mean in Northern Europe and in many other places. Having said that, no ideology has uh, rightness here. It can be any regime on either side of the right or left that would restrict the values that we hold. I also want to stress that I do believe that we should have a multiplicity of values in anthropology. So back to what a number of you have said, I do agree in the kinds of causes that we anthropologists tend to agree in, cultural diversity, and you know, uh, gender, gender diversity and inequality and so on. But I also want to make it clear that I want to see anthropologists from all over the spectrum. As distasteful as it may be, I want to see an anthropologist supporting Trump if they can do it in a principled way. Now, that may be a contradiction in terms, I fully agree. But I want people who can say, uh, who, who represent a variety of different perspectives because that's what our discipline should really be. If we all think the same, way in a cookie cutter way, that's probably bad for anthropology rather than good for anthropology. So I hope we can have diversity while still representing what anthropology stands for. Now, are these two principles contradictions? I don't think they are. I would like diversity within a common recognition of what anthropology is. That's the, that's the big question here. I hope we can do that. Now, the final thing I want to briefly talk about here was one of the questions that Clara was asking. Should anthropologists be involved in politics? And I had a big question about this in Hong Kong. And I was in mass media quite a bit over this because I am seen as, as a foreigner by mainland Chinese, but not by Hong Kongers. So if I were to protest in favor of democracy, I will instantly be labeled as I had been labeled as an American CIA agent. I am an agent provocateur trying to store up innocent Hong Kong students to have them believe in the rightness of American values and therefore why China should be destroyed. I mean, that's what's going to happen. So as a result, I didn't want to participate as an anthropologist. I can't participate as a citizen either because I'm too widely recognized. I'm, I'm a very, very, very minor celebrity in Hong Kong, but somebody will know who I am. What I can do is go as a teacher because if my students are being brutalized by police, I can go and see it. And my students would say, come on, you think you're coming here protecting us, we're protecting you. But by protecting me from getting beaten up by police, I'm protecting them because they're not getting beaten up. They're not getting arrested. This may help them in the future. So that was my own justification for why to do this. I think in being political act, politically active, we do need to be able to think through why and on what grounds we're doing it, because it's not inherently obvious given diversity of values. Now, having said all this, I'm trying to be a provocateur. I tend to agree with everybody here in most of our basic values, but I think we need to consider this diversity here as well, the possibility of anthropological diversity. Thank you. All right, Gordon, you are indeed being provocative. <laughs> Very provocative, though. I think that will stir things up. Um, so uh, the next uh, colleague, Subatra, please. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Gordon actually put me on to what I was going to say earlier, which I didn't. I think he's right in defending diversity of opinion as a part of anthropological methodology or as a part of the discipline. 
because as anthropologists, I believe, and this is a very critical uh, intersection of anthropology with politics, we should not as anthropologists begin by being judgmental. I know <clears throat> that uh, we do have this subjective, uh, we incorporate our subjectivism into our discipline methodology. And we do agree that we do have a location and a positionality from where we do work. But yet, as an anthropologist, I think it is also imperative that what we say should be derived from our methodology, from our ethnography, from our inquiries and empiricism, and not from our emotions. Because that way, we will cease to be an anthropologist. Like, for example, I will not say offhand that white supremacy is bad. That is a, that's a judgment. But as an anthropologist, I need to demonstrate. I need to be analytically correct. I need to be empirically enriched to show how it is and what it does in society, how it creates differences, what are the insidious, overt, covert, uh, social issues and uh, forces that is sets in place, which is divisive, which of course we will not, so which leads to marginalization. So as an anthropologist, it is also upon us to use our theoretical and methodological tools. We cannot be part of the political process minus these tools. Yes, as an anthropologist, as I said, when we empirically engage with the field and we look as very rightly Ed Levio said that we have to look at the particular as well, because we as anthropologists, we are not, which I said in the beginning, we are not looking at numbers, we are looking at humans, we are looking at people. And every people, and this is again a part of our anthropological ethics, all people are equally important to us. All communities are of equal significance and should be treated with the same respect. So in our analysis, in our engagement, as a, again, I gave an example that the present day regime in India is forcing the indigenous people to declare themselves as Hindus. Now we know as anthropologists, we have enough evidence with us to counter this, to contest this, and to engage politically in an in a process or an activism where we will be able to show that this is not true, that this is wrong. So this is, I think, where I agree to a large extent with Gordon that yes, not being judgmental and also being open is part of the ethics of anthropology, of being an anthropologist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Subatra. So we'll move on now to our colleague from Poland again, Lukas. Okay, the, um, uh, all of us uh, need to decide uh, what kind of uh, impact we can have on uh, public. So uh, for some of us, it's not uh, easy to change our way of uh, communication with the outside world. Uh, so we will keep uh, talking to our students and uh, we will do our uh, ethnography and maybe um, we make some dissemination in some papers or some books. And uh, it is very important what language we uh, use, uh, meaning uh, <laughs> in, in Polish case that uh, our academic system is forcing us to publish in English in order to uh, score the points uh, because they are um, using this kind of, um, I would say, pseudo uh, capitalist uh, logic that they have to uh, give us marks in order to uh, measure our value and uh, to <laughs> eliminate the not productive enough from academic system. But uh, we also need to remember to publish enough in Polish uh, and uh, not only in uh, academic journals, but also in uh, popular, uh, I don't know, newspapers, um, websites, uh, because uh, mm, otherwise we are um, 
um, substituted by this, uh, I would say, you know, para ethnographers, <laughs> the uh, journalists or some people with uh, this uh, terrible need of expression <laughs> Uh, that um, think that they uh, have seen everywhere and, and they know everything, so they would explain. Uh, so uh, in Poland, for instance, we have this uh, phenomenon that uh, um, we have uh, former American correspondents who are uh, commenting almost everything uh, what's going on in the world, in uh, Japan, China, Brazil, and uh, they have this respect because they have seen USA. So this is a little bit uh, funny. Uh, and uh, to, in order to comment such, uh, I don't know, cultural, social cultural uh, situations that uh, we observe around the world, they almost never uh, invite any anthropologist. So uh, there is also this, uh, uh, what uh, Sherry Altner was uh, uh, writing about. This is this uh, competition about the public culture attention in which uh, we are a little bit, um, uh, let's say, helpless, <laughs> uh, because we don't have all this apparatus uh, which is necessary uh, to be uh, in connection with uh, younger generations. So uh, we are trying to develop our skills, we are trying to uh, improve uh, in social media, in uh, movie making in uh, recording and uh, all uh, these technological things but uh, it is also very time consuming so uh, we are probably in the very beginning of some kind of shift in uh, technology in whole academia so probably <laughs> uh, our task is not to uh, stay far behind <laughs> and uh, just uh, to, to uh, find a good place and a good position in academic uh, new world uh, to be um, heard. <laughs> and uh, now I see, uh, of course, it's uh, too early to judge it, but uh, since the uh, pandemic, uh, beginning of pandemic situation, we've been uh, really afraid that uh, we will lose uh, students, <coughs> the people want to uh, uh, be, uh, let's say, keen to study uh, in the such conditions. But uh, because uh, the students also have more time to uh, get interested in uh, everyday situation around the world, they are using much more uh, media in order to learn something. Uh, we are observing a little increase of number of uh, candidates for studies and uh, the first year uh, students. So this is a little bit optimistic. As well, I see that uh, since we stopped to be very stiff, very, let's say, objective, and we are trying to comment everyday situations uh, honestly with our students, we are much more uh, interesting for them as well. And they see also human in their academic teachers. <laughs> so this is uh, optimistic. And um, of course, uh, it's a comment, and I, I agree completely with uh, uh, my um, with the uh, previous uh, speakers, and um, uh, that's what I wanted to say now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. So now we have Catalunya, Begonia. Are you there? Can you thank, thank you, Clara. Yes, I'm here. In connection with. Um, the previous speakers and a comment that Miguel Valle made in the chat. I really consider that the cultural and historical context is very, very uh, important because, for example, in Catalonia, uh, the independence claim is not a cause by itself. We have right wing political political parties which go for independence. We have uh, left-wing political parties which go for independence. We, we have far left or radical left political parties which go for independence. We've got civil uh, society organizations which go for political parties. So in this sense, advocating for the cause 
means advocating for a, a precise political position because the cause does not exist unless you put it together or connect it to a precise political party or political um, stance. Once that is said, uh, what is strange about this country, and I'm not talking about Catalonia now only, but about Spain as well, is the very few anthropologists that are involved either as active in politics or activism or involved in research on politics. Research on contemporary politics in Spain is mainly capitalized by political scientists, historians, and some sociologists. There are now some anthropologists that are working with the far right because the far right has increased its presence in, in the Spanish parliament and some voices claim that in, in February in Catalonia, they are getting eight deputies. At the moment, they have none. So this is a strange uh, situation and we'll see how this evolves. So in this uh, situation, it is very strange that so, uh, so little importance is given to the political context in our discipline. And in this context, I want to uh, let you know that the Catalan Institute of Anthropology, the ICA, in 2018 uh, decided that we could not remain silent in this context and we had to say something to position our discipline in the political struggles and conversations that were um, being held. So we devoted in 2018 our opening conference to what is called the Catalan question. We were amid the pro-independence wave and that was a year after the referendum on independence. Uh, as other political, uh, uh, sorry, as other uh, professional associations like sociology associations, political science associations, we have been asked to sign different manifestos pro liberty, pro democracy, pro independence, some of them, but we have not organized any event. This round table uh, was an absolute success. We got more than a hundred people attending it, which is not common in one in our events. And um, the debate that um, followed the round table was a burning debate, where the uh, discipline was kind of forgotten and the different political positions were defended in public. Shortly after this experience, uh, we decided as the ICA, as the Catalan Institute of Anthropology, that we should devote one of our monograph, monographic issues of our journal, Quaderns, to this question. Uh, and this journal was out in 2018. And you can see it on the internet. If anybody needs the reference, I will just write it on the chat. Of course, what has been called uh, the Catalan process, as well as other political questions, have been thoroughly addressed by others, as I mentioned. And this is strange because I consider that anthropologists can make an enormous contribution to contemporary politics and our understanding of contemporary politics because of our critical thinking and the revision we can promote about what politics are, as I mentioned before, and how politics move us and how politics affect us. That everybody is talking now about affective politics, emotional politics, how emotion, emotions drive our political decisions and elections, but here we have a big field of research for anthropologists. And apart from this, 
I think that uh, we can provide theoretical and methodological tools to capture our political presence and their effects, and that these tools are now necessary to understand the complexity of what surrounds us, even in these contexts that are more peaceful, if you allow me the word, than other contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Begonia. So now we will have once again our colleague from Brazil, Leticia. Okay, there's a lot going on in the chat. <laughs> I was trying to read some of the, the debates there, sort of running parallel. So I'll address one um, Gordon's um, provocation and then another issue that was um, uh, they've been discussing in, in the chat. Uh, of course, different perspectives within our discipline and in democracy at large are not only valuable, but very much welcome. The thing is, is the paradox of tolerance, right? Um, we know how it works. <laughs> if um, these, um, they are, it's adversaries discussing within a shared uh, public sphere and where rules are shared and where procedures are shared. That's fine. The thing is, I like the way Chantal Mouffe puts it. You know, it's, it's one thing to be an adversary in a democratic um, setting, in an academic setting. And the other thing is to be an, an enemy, uh, right? To see this other, this different as um, an enemy that should be expelled, right? From that's how Bolsonaro sees us, anthropologists and, and social sciences, scientists at large. And in anthropology, it's funny because um, there are um, two anthropologists in Brazil, just to give you an example, right? That of how they, the far right uh, works, not in this liberal pluralistic way. There's this guy, Carmen knows who he is. He was trained as an anthropologist in a very prestigious program. I did cross paths with him um, at the time and nobody knew who he was. And it turned out that um, after he graduated, he got his um, degree. He, um, it was revealed that he was actually the son of a missionary that had been expelled from indigenous, indigenous lands, right? And the guy basically took his title as an anthropologist and basically sold, right, um, his services to uh, big farmers and big landowners, just, you know, discrediting the entire process of um, uh, uh, expert, um, legal expert, the kind of anthropologist work that anthropologists do here to uh, support indigenous land claims. So again, they occupy and they infect it from within. There's another uh, case um, similar here of another anthropologist trained by, by who is probably the most famous Brazilian anthropologist globally, who basically after getting his PhD became an influencer on the far right uh, and he became famous by publishing a book where he unmasks the leftist bias in Brazilian academia. So this is not an adversary, right? They're not our adversary, legitimate adversary, because they basically want to destroy, infect from within and destroy um, the whole discipline, right? The whole pillars uh, of um, anthropologists as, um, as a discipline as it were. So the, se the second um, point uh, that's being discussed in the um, chat, which I found interesting, is about uh, um, public anthropology and especially ethnography's role in rendering visible some of the drivers of these far-right governments and, and movements. And that's, that's um, absolutely right. And I think besides rendering visible these drivers in terms of what goes on in the communities, right? What's drawing people to vote in these guys? We as anthropologists should, um, should uh, take seriously, right? What people think, what people feel, why they're engaging and, and feeling attracted to these kinds of, of discourses. And also, of course, re rendering visible also the kind of structure, communicational structure that um, uh, allows this guy on the other side to communicate with um, with regular citizens, and and I think he, there, um, as I said, anthropologist still has a lot of um, interesting work that it, it could be doing. Um, and of course, and uh, the final point that I would um, underscore is that um, I see a point in the rights critique of anthropology and and academia 
or progressive academia in the sense that we did perhaps get too self-centered, sometimes for reasons that are beyond our control. It's just how institutions work, right? The audit culture, all these production, uh, productivity uh, uh, obsession, it makes us very self-referential, right? So uh, the part of the critique is that we did uh, get um, distant from the language, the desires, the aspirations of common folks in Brazil and, and elsewhere. And I think some of that critique we should take seriously and try to do a better work as being anthropologists, because that's what we should do, right? We should uh, uh, see, try to see realities different than ours from the point of view of, of other people or of our common people, not just the groups that we like you know, indigenous groups, minorities, LGBT plus or whatever, you know, and I still see a lot of this inertia here in Brazil and perhaps in other places too. So we should go out there and talk to other groups like evangelicals and whatever, you know, people who think racism doesn't exist, like common people, common folks, and, and see what their point is and, and how we could uh, reconnect to them and learn from then because you know things are changing and we might be running behind uh, the right a little bit, not a little bit, a lot, I feel at least um, from my point of view here um, in Brazil. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leticia. So we'll now move again to Ed, Ed Libo, please. Thanks. Uh, so I too have been trying to keep up with the, um, uh, the discussion in the chat uh, and want to go back to something that Gordon in his provocation had uh, said uh, quite a bit earlier. Uh, so two points, one to distinguish between personal politics and the political implications of anthropological research. Um, and secondly, uh, to, to uh, talk a bit more about uh, diverse perspectives in the context that uh, Leticia just raised. Um, I, I don't think you should care what my personal politics are. I don't think politicians should care what my personal politics are. What I do think they should care about though is what the body of scholarship about uh, the need for policy reform. Um, and, and I think that that's a very different form of argument and one that we should be mindful of. Now, is there one consensus point of view in any of the areas where we're uh, where we care about whether it's in global health disparities whether it's climate change or uh, immigration reform or or forms of social justice and human rights or cultural heritage preservation no of course not there are a diverse range of findings um, that um, uh, that can be brought to bear uh, it, in the US political context I think something, um, that I may be restating the obvious, but I, the big difference between the two main political parties has to do with the, um, the views about the nature and extent of the role of the public sector um, in taking care of uh, uh, market failures. In the case of the generally the, the right, the Republican, party in this country, the US, um, the less interference on the part of the public sector, uh, the better. In the case of the left, the Democratic Party, uh, there is an active role to um, intervene where market forces simply have demonstrated far too convincingly that they don't work. The differences of opinion within that range um, have to do with um, how, where, and when to intercede with the resources um, and tools and apparatus of the uh, public sector uh, to overcome those kind of market forces. Again, um, my personal politics about that matter much less than um, the findings um, that, uh, uh, that our research collectively um, can bring to bear to demonstrate why if you try this, um, the unintended consequences um, are going to be catastrophic. If you try that, on the other hand, there's a more equitable uh, set of outcomes that uh, are likely to be achieved. 
um, so so um, I, I do think we just need to appreciate the difference between the personal um, and the collective um, and that we need to have that in mind as we uh, uh, think about the arguments that we uh, that, that we put forward in um, legible, accessible terms, um, as, as Lucas said, uh, so that uh, we meet people where they're prepared to hear what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a lot going on in the chat, as everyone mentioned. Uh, there's several questions and comments. There's an interesting one on how politics tie in with the language of academic thought, which is actually something we've been discussing a lot in our WCA webinars. Uh, once again, you know, which language, hegemonic languages, etc. But I think the main issue here in the chat, you probably will all agree with me because that's what you've been discussing, is the question. We, it sort of the chat brings us back to the initial question, which is: Should anthropologists interfere directly or not? And the issue of the binary poles, what is right, what is left, and, uh, and the fact that you cannot really judge what is right and left uh, outside of political and cultural and historical contexts. So I think this is the main issue here um, that we're discussing on the chat. So now the floor is open. I'm not going to, you know, keep saying who should talk first or afterwards, but just please react to all that has been discussed here by everyone and also in the chat. Um, so I don't know who wants to take the word now. Can I, if nobody's... Sure, let you go ahead. Just very quickly, uh, the two questions are, are great. Um, I would just add one thing about the language. I think we should as communicators can you sorry, in, sorry for interrupting can you put your uh yourself yeah sure. in terms of my research on what worked for the far has been working for the far right um in terms of efficacy in communication it's not just verbal language i think image and visual language is extremely in, important and increasingly important it's not by chance that instagram and tiktok are like increasingly um, popular um, apps, um, not here in Brazil, but in lots of places. So I think anthropology has a long, of course, tradition in visual anthropology and films. And, um, and so just adding that um, the importance of visual language as well. And it's language that's universal, right? You don't have to know how to read and write or speak English or whatever other language to sometimes get the message across. And that's a lot of what the, the far right does. Um, uh, here and elsewhere as well. It's um, it's it's um, tapping onto that um, non-written, non um, non um, uh, sophisticated kind of language, right? And the the other point uh, about left and right, it's very very tricky. This is a moving, um, shifting a field, and here in Brazil, very clearly how the emergence of the far right basically reshuffle the entire political spectrum and it's very the, these changes are very emergent in the sense that they're not stabilized yet so i think another axis that we should be looking at when we talk about this not necessarily left and right and some people have mentioned this in the chat is liberal and, and authoritarian in the sense right because and, and liberals here in brazil they insist a lot in that that we should take be taking into account this other axis as well, because they don't see themselves necessarily to the left or to the right. And the problem with the right, with the far right, is not that they're right wing, right, but that they are um, non-liberal, they are illiberal, authoritarian. So I think that's very important to mix with the far with the far left right um, uh, axis as well whenever we're discussing politics today. Um, Leticia, I wholly agree with what you just said. I completely agree. But one ongoing problem is the standard liberal view has been that rational discussion will lead the best ideas to win in the end. Now, temporarily, that won't happen. You elect Bolsonaro, you elect Donald Trump, you elect so many other people. However, the faith that many of us have is if we do teach and write, we will contribute in a tiny way to liberal values working out. This is what the uh, thinker Steven Pinker uh, said, writes about so much in terms of enlightenment values triumphing. On the other hand, artificial intelligence 
sh an algorithm show that maybe that's not true. And that's what's most frightening today. Maybe good values don't win out. And that's deeply, deeply disturbing. I don't know where this is coming to. You've all know Harari in the Homo Deus talks about how we can only be ruled by artificial intelligence because we're too stupid to rule ourselves, uh, among other things. So who knows where this may come to? I mean, I have a powerful liberal faith that if I teach in a certain way, the world will become better, not immediately, but eventually. Yet is that faith worth holding to? I don't know. I agree. I agree with what Gordon said that it is uh, optimism is a virtue but something which we have to keep looking back and looking into is as anthropologists as i said we do have to keep look, going back to the field look at what people are saying look at what they're doing uh, keep in touch with the reality i mean we as anthropologists are grounded and that is the strength of our discipline that we are grounded, we are into what where things are happening. And if things are not happening, I mean, rightly said, it is a it is a choice between a totalitarian or a populist and a liberal regime. Why the question then as theoreticians? Because we cannot always leave theory behind. The theory is analytical abilities is the question before us is why this is happening what is pushing the world why are people electing trump why are they electing bolsonaro they are not dictators they have come from the uh, ground level they have come from the votes of the people so this is where i think anthropology needs to apply itself to analyze and understand this phenomenon Hello? Yeah, I, I, I completely, I completely agree. I think I, I'm, I don't know whether I'm very optimistic about the continuity of the liberal freedoms we've been living under so far, but I think that has to be connected with something that has been appearing during the debate that is the importance of studying political diverse positions, you know, because through exploring different experiences of the political different positions, those who we agree with and those who we cannot understand is the way we can maybe reach an understanding or I don't know, it's very difficult for me to express this, but I think it is very important that we don't only focus on those who are a danger for the state of things that we've known, but we can all, for example, now there's a huge amount of people working on the uh, illiberal, um, right, uh, illiberal far right, in Eastern Europe, for example, but there's few people working on the left and the left exists and the left is, I, I'm still using right and left right here, but so it is interesting to see how things are working in every position and from practical experiences so in common people as well, because maybe that way we will understand how Trump won, or Orban won, or Bolsonaro won, or, you know, and sometimes things are even more difficult, as I said, as with independence here, because it's not attached to a political position, but it's transversal. So, well, we need to, know, to explore that, how it works, what it makes, how it moves people, and why it moves people, if possible. Okay, thank you very much, Begonia, for your input. I don't know if, uh, I mean, you know, normally the webinars take one and a half hour, a uh, few more minutes tops. Uh, I don't know if anyone else from the participants wants to pitch in or um, or if we, of I, course, I, here forever. May I yes. talk? 
uh, Leticia? Oh, and uh, yeah, okay. Normally, yeah, normally the audience just writes on the chat, but go ahead, yes, please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, no, uh, I'm from Uruguay, and um, well, it's a privilege for me to, to share this, this meeting. Um, no, I just point out that um, I, I, I work in the educational ministry of my country, and, and uh, I work in this ministry during 30 years. So I, I work to government from the left, from the center, from the right, from uh, any kind of political thinking. And uh, fortunately in our country, there are not extreme positions. It's like the left or the right are, are not extremely now. So uh, it's, um, it's not, it's, this is, I think this is not the, the principal difficult in, in our community of anthropologists. But I think the problem is ourselves, uh, how we present ourselves. Um, uh, unmute your microphone, Leticia. I think we have a problem here with Leticia. I think she had a bomber and Michelle muted her. Hola. <laughs> I, we... may, may I talk or not? Yes, please. <laughs> well, sorry. Now, I just want to, to say that I think that in, a, in our country where there is not such extreme political positions from the left or from the right, the problem, I think, is our how we can develop our critical thinking in relation with our uh, our way of present ourselves as scientists, as social scientists, and what is our role in the in the politics of the government? What is our really what we can say? What is the importance of this of the vision that, that the social anthropologist can can bring? I think that is our problem. It's not the problems of others that don't recognize us. I think that we must, in our case, uh, develop our critical thinking and try to be more realistic in our, in our work, in our projects, uh, and, and try to understand the game you know, in such way, uh, the game between the politics and the reality and the, the rights of the people and the, how we can uh, define channels of participation of the people that is, is the most difficult, at least for me, is, is the most difficult. But well, it's just to say this and thank you very much for, for allowing me to share this, this, this chat, okay? Okay, so uh, Letitia, thank you very much. I don't know if anyone from the participants has anything else to say or otherwise we'll close it here. Of course, there's a lot of reflection that could go on, we could go on reflecting on this issues forever. Some of the things that were brought up, some of the issues that were brought up in the chat have actually been addressed in previous WCA webinars as indigenous, indigenous rights, etc. But anyway, this will be, well, this has been our last webinar in 2020, this crazy year that we've been all living in the world. Um, and we will go on with our webinars next year. Of course, the video, uh, the record of this um, webinar will be online as well as the chat. And I want to once again, thank everyone for participating. I think it has been really interesting. A lot of questions, uh, some answers, mostly questions, of course, but that's normal, I think, in, with anthropologists. Um, someone is asking when will the recording be posted? Normally it takes two days, more or less, for it to be posted on the website. And I want to also thank all the members of the organizing committee who have been present in this webinar, Carmen Rial, our chair, um, Helen McDonald from South Africa, Virginia Dominguez from the US, and who else is there? Let me see, oh, Isaac Nomiongo from Nigeria. And uh, we will for sure um, see you all again, hopefully in uh, January when we go back to our webinars. And I wish you all a very 
nice end of 2020, well, as nice as possible, thinking in terms of all the crazy world we're in now. And uh, thank you very, very much to everyone, uh, the participants and the people in the chat. And have a good night, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on your time zones. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you so much. Ciao.